So I uh, appreciate everybody stopping in and, and checking out these presentations. Um, it's funny how this this idea originated. It was it was more for staff development than anything. And then uh, the idea of, uh, of bringing it to the public came to light and we decided to make it a deal where uh, we put it out there um, for everyone to see. You know, uh, I think it gives good exposure and it's a good developmental tool for people to talk in front of people and research things that maybe they don't feel extremely comfortable about talking about and putting it out there in the open. So uh, we had a great lineup of speakers earlier. I think my guys did a great job and Cody did a phenomenal job. We have a, a, a great lineup, uh, another four speakers at the end of the day today to finish this thing out. Uh, I hope you guys benefit from it. I mean, if you could take one thing out of any of these presentations, I think they're worthwhile to watch. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about isometric uh, considerations for college football theory and application. All right, uh, something that's kind of become the come the uh, the popularity has definitely increased of isometric exercises. Specifically, uh, you look at today with our current situation, a lot of people don't have means to to do traditional weightlifting, um, so they've kind of relied on on these ready homemade. Uh, exercises and modalities and some that's become extremely popular is overcoming isometrics because of, again, the practicality of it, the, uh, the complexity of it, and then uh, obviously the creativity of it because you can you could essentially make an isometric exercise, specifically overcoming isometric exercise at a majority of your household uh, items, like a door, a, door, a door frame, a towel, whatever. But let's get into uh, the, the nuts and bolts. Uh, disclaimer, I, I am not a doctor or physiologist. Uh, I am not an expert in this specific facility or the specific uh, scope of what we're going to talk about today. I am a general practitioner. So, um, you know, I got to give the disclaimer. Many of these theories and concepts were developed by guys a lot smarter than I am, a lot smarter. And uh, uh, everything I'm talking about today essentially is just through my scope, how I interpret it and how we implement it uh, and how we, again, how we use it, that's, that's it. But again, I'm the, I'm the creator of none and the borrower of many, all right? And so, you know, Christian Thibodeau, Max Marza, Matt Van Dyke, Cal Dietz, Alan Bishop, um, you know, if you're looking for uh, more information on it, I highly suggest you buy Max and Matt's book. Uh, it's extremely thorough and I reference it a ton. Um, I, I highly suggest you go reach out and get triphasic training, uh, it, it kind of, you know, almost as cultish now how, how people lean on this book because of how good the information in it is. Um, and then high, high Threshold Muscle Building by Christian Thibodeau. Uh, he does a fantastic job talking about a lot of the concepts we're going to talk about today, right? So what is what is an isometric contraction, right? And we got to boil it down to, to the bare basics, all right? And essentially it's a muscle, our muscles are producing force without movement, right? Um, an isometric contraction of the muscle occurs when tension developed within the muscle is equal to the external load imposed upon the muscle. So the easiest way to think of an isometric contraction is for you to go up against the wall and push as hard as you can, right? There's absolutely zero movement. Even though you're still, you're still contracting, even though there's still tensile, uh, there, there's, there's fascial tensile strength being uh, developed, which we'll get into later, but there's absolutely no movement. Okay? So again, the definition is in between Okay, it's the wedge between eccentric and concentric actions. Okay, and we'll get into the trans break, my little my little drag racing uh, metaphor. Uh, but again, it's it's you have these three muscle contractions, right? That Gino hit upon um, and and Sean hit upon. You have an eccentric contraction, an isometric contraction, a concentric contraction in every dynamic movement. Okay, so again, it's the bridge between that eccentric, that lengthening. And again, that concentric action, which is that shortening, um, uh, again, that, how, or how I think of it, absorbing to uh, absorbing force to pro creating propulsive force, okay, right? We think that the muscles aren't, again, that there's not smaller muscle, uh, micro contractions going on in that muscle fiber just because we're in a lot position, but there are. So that sliding filament theory is still in play um, they're just smaller muscle contractions going on, right? And then isometric stability is required to some extent in every movement. So us sitting here currently, um, there is muscles in our body that are isometrically contracting. I know uh, Greg Cook hit upon it with, with phasic and tonic muscles, right? So a lot of our muscles in our back, um, again, are isometrically contracting at all times to maintain our posture, right? Um, you know, so again, our neck muscles, uh, you know, when our arms are just hanging out our sides, our arm, you know, our, our, our biceps, triceps, our deltoids, all these other muscles are working isometrically. So we have isometric contractions going on all day long. 
right? And then again, it's a, there, there's a critical role in executing movements in a synchronized, efficient, and powerful as forces transmute, uh, trans, transferred through muscle action. So again, as we go through this stretch shortening cycle and understand that eccentric force is, you know, the importance of all of these dynamic uh, contractions, okay? It's also important to understand that the more synchronized it is, the more force demands are going to be, and that we want to continue to create powerful movements through all three of these phases. So essentially, getting this kinetic energy to transfer all the way through these dynamic muscle coordinations, so that we don't ooze, like I'll like I'll talk to and allude to later, or lose or leak energy as we go about uh, creating this force, right? And this is the famous V. So if you if you've read triphasic training. Um, you've probably seen it before. Uh, you've probably seen it all over the internet, right? And it's this, it's this, this concept that elite athletes move through these three muscle coordinations at a much steeper and faster rate than, um, than advanced athletes even, okay? So again, as you can see, uh, the eccentric phase is much sharper. Isometric phase, again, is able, uh, like we'll get into, is able to withstand and transmit these forces to concentric action. So we're able to absorb force, uh, we're able to hold on to this force and then redistribute it uh, in, in a way that's going to be propulsive in nature. Or, okay, moving on. What are, what are the benefits? What are the benefits of, of isometric training, right? So we look at, there's three specific ones. So you have the structural adaptations. So anytime that you can increase time under tension, you're going to see these, these, these structural adaptations that occur. So you get hypertrophy. Uh, you know, so again, increasing time under tension, and we'll specifically talk about our long duration isometrics that we get into uh, later on that can, can increase specific hypertrophy in, in, in specific body parts and specific areas, right? We look at uh, fascial length, right? So increasing fascial length, all right? And then we look at also um, the tendon stiffness that occurs with uh, isometric training, right? So stiffening of the spring, which is extremely important because we talk about, uh, we'll talk about Again, athletic abilities, uh, what makes people special and, and bouncy, being able to be bouncy is one of them. So again, why is tendon stiffness important? Because again, it, it could also make you a more efficient athlete. So when we talk about running economy, uh, people that have um, more efficient um, tendons, more, uh, stiffer tendons, right? You're not gonna use as much cont uh, contractile strength uh, as you run, right? And then you get into the metabolic adaptations, right? So increased tolerance of metabolic buildup, right? So again, we get into um, being able to combat lactate, uh, keeping the proper pH levels inside that muscle itself, um, and, and really, you know, basically making you a more uh, robust uh, athlete as far as from that consideration from a metabolic standpoint. And then you talk about the neural adaptations, right? So you talk about post-action potentiation, right? Uh, brain function, and then that muscle coordination that comes along with any neural adaptation, right? Being a more coordinated athlete, uh, firing more motor, uh, motor neurons per muscle, right? Where does it occur in, sport, in sports, right? So you know, where, where, where does isometrics fall in the line of sports performance, right? So you see it um, in, in all actions, right? Because we know that in any dynamic movement, there's going to be three phases of contractile uh, properties, right? You're going to have eccentric, isometric, and then concentric. But majority of where I see it is in the amortization phase or in the stance phase of either in running or in agility training, okay? Um, you will also see it occur in grappling sports, uh, you know, or, which football in the trenches can, can be considered a grappling sport because, due to the nature and demand of the physicality in there. So again, it's, it's this idea that you see it in running. Majority of the time you're gonna see it in running, but you'll see it in a ton of grappling sports as well as they're trying to hold positions. Um, gymnastics, you'll see it a ton because again, they're holding positions. So anytime you see really an athlete come to a stop, that's a, a high demand for isometric strength, okay? You know, again, what we're going to talk about the stretch shortening cycle, I think uh, Coach, Coach uh, Gino did a fantastic job earlier in his presentation of kind of nailing down what it is. Right? But you look at the different phases, right? So the, 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 the lengthening phase, the amortization phase, and then obviously the concentric phase, okay? Or the, the shortening phase, all right? So force production is equivalent to ground reaction forces of landing. That is where isometric actions occur. So in C, you can see that we are, we are transmuting or trans we are putting the same amount of force in the ground as the ground is electing on us, right? So again, why is it important? If we can't maintain, or if the ground puts too much force, we might lose position, right? Or, or if we're oozing energy, okay, this can lead to postural issues, 
and then you look at uh, the cyclical nature of a lot of, uh, of a lot of the activities I previously mentioned, it could further um, further disrupt the coordination and firing of other muscle groups if we're not sufficient in being able to hold this energy, right? Again, it's responsible for the rapid transfer of energy within a muscle tendon structure, okay? So if we're not strong isometrically, but we're trying, we're, we're getting expressed to high levels of force, this could end up in catastrophic failure such as a, a torn Achilles or uh, a torn calf muscle or other uh, damage to these muscles or to other damage period. And then again, uh, something to, to definitely hit upon, uh, and this has kind of come to light as research has really gone into isometric training is high speed, low amplitude movements. The tendon will deform during the eccentric portion. What people are suggesting, um, specifically Franz Bosch's uh, um, Franz Bosch's camp, the muscles will have to maintain length and contract isometrically. So again, uh, the need for isometric strength as these tendons deform and then the fatigue resistant as it occurs over and over and over because it's a repetitive movement, right? It's in all sports we run, right? So this is repetitive movement. So again, the duration of practices as we fatigue, the, uh, the importance of isometric exercises are definitely gonna be a lot higher, right? And then again, to get back into the, uh, the stress shortening cycle. So again, you could see in that coiled up spring, essentially is going to be our amortization phase, that isometric phase. So again, if that spring isn't strong enough, it's gonna deform, okay? Or it's gonna leak energy, right? And then it's not gonna be able to have as much propulsive force or the contractile force, uh, the extension force that you would see um, if it was a strong isometric spring, being able to hold that, right? And then the stress shortening cycle phases are experienced during a hop, right? So this is an example, right? So this occurs with every dynamic movement to some extent. So you can see all three phases in this specific diagram. All right. And again, all right, what do we want to avoid? And we all see it. We all see it. And as soon as you say ooze, uh, I, I, I guarantee there's athletes that come in mind um, that lack stiffness. Uh, and essentially, this could be kind of attributed to a lot of reasons. It's a multifactorial problem. But at the same time, I think isometric uh, exercises, isometric training, I'm not saying that it's the holy grail because it's not. It's just another tool in the toolbox. But I think it can aid in a lot of these postural issues, in a lot of these uh, stiffness issues. I think, again, it's just another tool to lean on as we look at the problems uh, that we see in, in our populations of athletes. Okay, So, again, we want to avoid the ooze. You see it. That foot hits the ground when someone's running. They spend their, their ground contact. Uh, their ground contact times are, are elongated. Uh, you know, you see weird shapes. Uh, you see uh, postural breakdown, um, and then obviously you, you'll see, you'll start to see the excel, or uh, excuse me, uh, anterior pelvic tilt as you work up the chain, which will lead to, you know, that overstride and issues, okay? Um, or you see it in an old lineman that has a great initial uh, punch, right? And then they're trying to hold position and they lose that position, either because of it's it, uh, fatiguing in nature and they're not, they haven't been exposed to that type of fatigue, or because again, um, they're just not strong enough to hold those forces isometrically in that specific situation. So again, we're just trying to fight the ooze, okay? You know, we're, again, where is it prevalent? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Wayne uh, he, he, and how it applies, again, you talk about the stress shortening cycle and then the need for isometric and uh, isometric stiffness. And like I previously alluded to is people are starting to question, uh, again, that isometric contractions play a larger part in running and in the stretch shortening cycle, especially because it's those tendons deform, right? So what, what did what does this two spring model say? But uh, what are the two elements that it specifically hits on? And it's high limb velocity pre-impact and it's that stiff landing. So again, if we're not strong isometrically on that landing, if we cannot contribute to that stiff landing with our contractile properties, we're gonna ooze energy. We're gonna ooze force and we're not gonna be as, uh, we're not gonna have as powerful or as forceful of a, a, as a contraction uh, concentrically moving into the next one, right? Then what is, what is again, what does science say about this, right? So again, um, you know, this, it, again, it alludes back to what I previously talked about, which was uh, the single leg Roman chair hold is more effective than the Nordic hamstring curl in improving hamstring strength, endurance, and Gaelic football players. And basically what this, this, this research article stated was, is the isometric fatigue ability, the ability to resist fatigue isometrically contributed to um, preserving 
hamstring injuries, right? Or excuse me, preserving the hamstring to avoid injuries versus the Nordic curl itself. So again, alluding to this fact that, all right, we're, we're in the stretch shortening cycle in these, in these repetitive movements, we are contributing isometrically to that stretch, that stress shortening cycle and that the ability to uh, um, be more robust to fatigue is actually an extremely important attribute to change and that you can only get through isometrically training itself, right? And this is what it stated. It, it has recently been argued that muscle fibers of hamstrings remain predominantly isometric during the swing phase of high-speed running, despite an overall increase in muscle tendon unit length. A fatigue-induced reduction in force output from muscle fibers will result in an ability of the muscle fibers to remain isometric with a result increase in length and micro damaging occur. So basically, essentially a strain. This mechanism may explain the association described between fatigue and injury, okay? The results of the current study suggest that isometric strength training may positively impact on injury risk by improving hamstring strength, endurance, and modifying the potential injury process. So again, you can see the benefit of these isometric training uh, modalities as uh, um, you avoid that fatigue that will let, that will result in increased lengthening and, and the possibility of micro damage or um, strains and tears in that hamstring. Okay, you know, and we talked about the balance. Where, where, where does it lie on, on the hierarchy of athletic development? So again, it's it's right there up at the top, right under speed. Right, so we always want to increase our elasticity and reactive strength. And I think um, as far as when it comes to explosive isometrics and uh, that you're going to get. A, a high bang for your buck uh, as far as it pertaining to training, the, the elastic reactive uh, components of strength training, all right? And then again, how does, it, how does it affect structural adaptations, right? So these are different studies, right? Effects on different isometric contractions on tendon elasticity in the human quad. Um, and basically what it said was, is there was an increase uh, in stiffness of the tendon uh, complex, okay? So again, making that quad uh, that quad tendon a little bit more robust, right? More, more studies, the effects of long-term isometric training on core stiffness, right? We all do planks. Do we know why we do planks? Do we know why we like planks, right? So again, you know, we all utilize all, all these isometric exercises all the time, but what is, what does science tell us about it, right? It is important since increased core stiffness enhances load bearing ability, right? So again, you talk about, um, uh, proxile stability equals distal speed or distal velocity, right? So, uh, you, 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 some that Greg Cook always talked about all the time, and I know Charlie Weingroff is on all the time, is, is this idea of trying to shoot a cannon from a canoe, right? If something's not stable, you can't create velocity. So, again, why is it the structural adaptations? And you can see with isometric contractions, they improve the, the overall uh, tensile strength in the abdomen, in, in the lower back, in the upper back. It allowing you to have a better platform for more explosive violent movements from a distal standpoint, right? So this may explain the uh, the efficacy reported for back and knee injury reduction. So again, the more stable we are, okay, the less injuries that may occur because we'll be in better positions from a postural standpoint, biomechanical standpoint. All right. So again, moving on to metabolic buffering, right? So we all we all know, yeah, and we've all heard this this lactic acid buildup and all this, you know, and, and, and coaches say it all the time. Well, um, isometrics, you know, they're, they, they, the, the tissue can be trained to become more efficient with clearance of, metabolic, of, of metabolites, or excuse me, metabolites, or to become increasingly tolerant due to the, the implementation of specific isometric training. So again, isometric training can expose you to high levels uh, of acidity in the muscle, right? Uh, because of the long duration of it. And again, it's a safe way to do it, which again, will give you more lactate buffering capacity, which is extremely important in specific sports and, and in specific uh, training periods throughout the year, right? So again, effects of high intensity intermittent, this is more science telling you that uh, essentially that it does a good job, isometric training does a great job of uh, increasing uh, lactate uh, buffering capacity, okay? And then you look at the neural side of it, the neural side, which is extremely important, right? So from you look from a neural side, all right, we're trying to increase Force production by activating more muscle uh, muscle units, um, right? Maximally activating more muscle units and again, pr uh, producing greater force per fiber. And then we're also looking to, again, get the, the switching on and off of muscle groups, the coordination of muscle groups, synergistic working of muscle groups. So then you talk about, well, how does isometrics fit into this? So like you look from an inner muscle, uh, intermuscular coordination standpoint, you talk about co-contraction, so antagonistic, antagonistic. So there's this, this gigantic, 
tug of war battle going on between these muscles, um, you know, which can be beneficial from a stiffness standpoint, right? And then here it is again, the evidence of altered uh, corticomotor excitability following targeted activation of glute. And essentially, again, this is exactly what we saw is, is more uh, motor unit, more maximal motor unit recruitment, and then the, the uh, that co-contraction co going on, all right? So how do you program it, right? Because it's like this, this crazy idea and, and, and you know, there's almost like this idea that if you're not following this triphasic model, you're doing it wrong, right? So again, to me, it's just another tool in the toolbox, right? And, and anytime you talk about exercises or programming in general, they all abide by this specific program, uh, th this idea that you got to manipulate program variables, right? So we're going to look at format, frequency, volume, intensity, the mode, and then what's the recovery process behind it? So in any exercise, I think these are the, these are the, the, the variables that you have to harp on and you have to sit down and look at before you just throw something into your program, right? So how do we how do we integrate it? We integrate it in a high low system. So again, on our high days, we're gonna we're gonna try to maximize our high days, right? We want our high days to be high, so we want to match stresses. So those are gonna be the days that that we implement uh, maybe some some PAP strategies using and utilizing isometric exercises, or maybe that's where we just incorporate isometric exercises in general, just by themselves to drive for, uh, for either from an explosive overcoming or an explosive yielding, right? You look at our low days, okay? Our low days, what we might do is those are where our longer duration isometrics will fit in, um, you know, and again, because again, the hypertrophy uh, aspect of it and then the structural aspect of it from the, uh, the, the fascia lengthening uh, that could come along with that or the lactate buffering capacity from a metabolic standpoint, which fits in on those low, uh, those low days where we're trying to drive peripheral stress, not central uh, central nervous system. Because again, at the end of the day, we're trying to maximize our rate of uh, our return on the Right. So when you look at any exercise, right, we're going to start simple and we're going to move to complex. As we move through this continuum, the exercise modality will change. And this is where that variable, where it either is from a, uh, a volume prescription, an intensity prescription, a change uh, variation in the exercise itself. Um, we will start simple and we'll move to more complex methods, right? And then just following suit, just like that, uh, just with the previous slide, is we'll move from general to specific uh, with all these exercises. Again, so specific to the sport uh, and some of, and when I mean specific, I don't mean the sport itself. I mean as as specific as we can be in the weight room. So I don't want people to think that, you know, we're, we're, we're doing isometric work, you know, in, in online indie, uh, but Again, general to specific. And how does this look, right? So again, uh, you take a simple concept, a, a simple exercise, like maybe like uh, um, an isometric contract, uh, isometric hold during a hyper, and you can make it more complex by taking that foot off. You can make it even more complex. Again, you're working a similar muscle group with this sprinter bridge with alternating leg um, holds where you're going back and forth. So you added some uh, dynamic component to it to make it a little bit more complex. And then you could add an explosive element to it, which you can see in this bottom right screen where this guy is literally hopping. Now he is hopping from leg to leg, um, switching those legs, again, adding that explosive, uh, uh, explosive modality to it, again, increasing the complexity of it. And then from general to specific, right? So you look at, um, you look at we're in a split squat position where we're just in a split squat hold to elevating the front foot to where now there's more force on that front leg all right and then again more postural demand because of the uh the the surface area being knocked down to one then you get into a loaded foot front or back foot elevated uh hold and then you could see the a hold on the wall which is specific to running again is it exactly the same no but are we just trying to, to get in the ballpark? Yes. And I think that's where, again, you're never going to be able to mimic the exact movement itself, but can you mimic some of the properties that go along with enhancing the specific movement? And I think that's where it lies. And it, it kind of boils down to that, that dynamic correspondence, right? It's maybe, it may not be the exact exercise, but is it going to benefit the exercise you're going to, or you're chasing after enhancing okay we're moving shoot i say movement that you're trying to enhance not exercise right because we're trying to we're trying to enhance movements not exercises all right so moving on how do you how do you scale intensity and volume with isometrics okay and, it, and with anything it boils down to this there's an inverse relationship between volume and intensity the more intense the exercise is 
the less duration it's going to be and the less volume you're going to prescribe. All right. So again, it just falls along with all of those other variables that we spoke upon earlier. All right. What are the guidelines for? To me, the way that I program isometrics is very similar to how I program uh, how I program Olympic lifting as it pertains to our explosive overcoming and yielding isometrics. Okay, so again, we're going to use prevalence chart again because it's a, try, a a tested and true method that's stood the test of time in prescribing, right? Uh, and, and prescribing the right intensities and then obviously getting the optimal ranges. All right, so how does that look? Right, we look at classification of central versus peripheral. So again, um, you know, just trying to classify these exercises. Uh, and, and the way I classify exercises again in this high low model that we use is is I want to see where it lies as far as total motor unit involvement. All right, so in the in the, the chart that you'll see on the next page, again, any percentage is going to be that total motor or total motor unit rec uh, involvement and how it correlates to this specific chart and these specific exercises and how I view them. Right. So when you get into it, into intensity classifications. Okay, so I put some examples and we'll get into classifications of exercises. Of, uh, of specific exercises isometrically later on. These are just some examples, but you can see again. So you look at depth jumps, which is a, a yielding uh, exercise, right? So again, absorbing energy uh, and then redis uh, redistributing. It, okay, so that isometric contraction is more uh, absorbing. So that'd be a yielding exercise, right? So depending upon the, the box height, okay, it could fall in any of those rep ranges from 70 to 100 plus, right? You do a super maximal back, uh, uh, Depth drop, okay, um, and land on one leg. That's going to be sure, that's going to be well over 100 percent as far as relative intensity. And you look at pause weighted jumps. The same idea. As you increase the weight, the isometric contraction, the force within that isometric contraction is going to be a lot higher. Okay, and then you move into trap bar kettlebell drops. Uh, something that Corey Schlesinger made has made extremely popular, which I, I like a lot. Um, is this explosive yielding exercise? You could see again, depending upon the weight of the trap bar, the weight of the kettlebell, um, and the, the 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 length of the isometric contraction, it could go all the way up to 100. And then you talk about those sperm bridge hop-ins, um, again, ranking 70 to 90 percent as far as relative uh, motor unit involvement. All right. Then you look at explosive overcoming, and these are going to be more intense in nature, um, in general. Right. So you talk about your 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 rack pulls or your pin pulls. Okay. Those are going to be you know 80 plus. Um, you look at, again, the pin presses. So you look at upper body pin presses. It's going to be in that 70 to 90 range. You look at those pin, uh, pin presses, lower body wise. So those, those driving that bar up in there in a squat, whether it's, you know, a full squat or from a quarter squat position or from, uh, again, the, the, the creativity of it is because it's joint specific is through the roof. But you can see those are extremely taxing on that central nervous system. And then you talk about wall or sled a hold. So again, maximum where the sled doesn't move. Obviously, a wall isn't going to move unless you're 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 the Hulk. But seeing it in that range between 70 and 100 percent, depending upon the duration, right? Then you look at long duration, right? So a goblet squat hold, right? That's going to be in that lower spectrum. Same with the split squat holds, body weight uh, push up holds are going to be down uh, relative. So anything again, you see this inverse relationship consistently. Uh, and I can go on and on and on about about the different percentages, but there's an inverse relationship between, again, volume and intensity. And the way that we we calculate volume is is obviously is going to be the duration of the exercise. So, and you'll see this in the prescription of how we we uh, uh, prescribe times for these isometric exercises. Okay, so again, look at the top, the classification, you know, the intensity relative to the exercise. So, you know, anything in that hundred plus range. You know, we're only going to do two to three sets. All right. Um, you know, you get the 80, 90, you're going to go two to five sets, you know, 70 to 83 to six, 60 to 70, three to six. And then again, 50 to 60, three to six. Right. Uh, anything 70 or above, you know, we're not going to go more than 10 seconds. OK, we're not going to go more than 10 seconds. Uh, again, because of the extreme nature of these exercises, um, you know, we could we, you, you could risk injury doing these exercises if, if you have that intent. And again, you're you're trying to dry uh, your your you're on that upper end of the intensity uh, classification of exercise. Okay, so ex explosive yielding, you'll see it seven to 10 in that 70 to 80 range, 80 to 90, we're going five to seven seconds, 90 to 100, right? Three seconds, 100 plus, we're at about three seconds. Okay, same thing with the explosive, seven to 10, five to seven, three and three. 
Now you look when we get to these longer duration yielding, right? So if you increase the intensity, we're gonna be anywhere from 15 to 20 seconds. Uh, you know, that could be a, a heavy, heavy um, suitcase hold or a farmer's walk or, uh, you know, a, a super maximal plank, right? As soon as you remove some of that intensity, the duration can go up. It could be 30 plus seconds, right? We all, you know, we've all prescribed, you know, in terms of sleep on TV, we've probably all prescribed a plank for a minute. That's what it would, I would, that's exactly what it would correlate to, right? So what's what? Exercise classification, right? So I, again, this is straight out of the book. Uh, Matt Van Dyke and Master Marshall wrote, and I didn't want to I, I didn't want to butcher and, and try to come up with my own when they did such a great job of classification of these exercises. Right, so you got isolated and you got complex exercises. So essentially, an isolated exercise is a single muscle group versus a complex, which is multiple muscle groups working synergistically together. Right, you got long muscle versus short muscle. So they think arm extended holding the bar versus arm contracted holding a bar. Right. Um, you got long duration, like we spoke of earlier. So, and then you got explosive, uh, like we spoke of earlier. And you saw how we we differentiate between the prescription of how many seconds and time duration of sets that we'll do there. And then you have again, you have these co-contractions where there's this extreme tug of war. You have this overcoming, okay? Which uh, the way I think of it is is propulsive force. Um, so trying to create propulsive force. Uh, and then I think of yielding. Okay, as the opposite as absorbing force, the ability to absorb force. Okay, and again, you think, well, like, what do some of these exercises look like? And, you know, a lot of what we do is yielding, right? So, again, you look at uh, a change of direction uh, movement, regardless what movement, at some point in time, you're going to have some yielding isometric forces involved, right? When you land in a jump, there's yielding isometric uh, forces involved. Uh, if you did a rapid RDL and stopped at the bottom, there's a yielding, uh, yielding isometric forces involved, okay? Uh, so again, it's this ability to absorb force and then hold that position uh, without moving, okay? So that's how I, I conceptualize yielding, right? I look at overcoming as producing, right? So again, we're producing force against an external object that is producing the same amount or if not more force on us so that we cannot move it. All right, so again, you look at these pin pulls, these rack, uh, rack presses. Um, you see a lot of these, uh, these exercises that we'll get into further on how we actually implement them. But um, again, maximum intent on these exercises, extremely taxing neurally. Um, but again, it's just producing of the force, right? You look at isolated, okay, isolated. So again, if he's just to hold the dumbbell in that specific uh, area, we're talking about a short, isolated contract, isometric contraction. Um, so again, it's just a single muscle group. There, obviously, there's more, there's form and it's bicep organ, but it's isolated to a specific uh, region of his body versus being globally, right? And then we look at joint specific. So you look at long. So if I were to do overhead carry, I saw Alan Bishop was doing overhead carries uh, yesterday. Uh, again, this isn't, that's actually technically a upper body isometric exercise. Um, and it's joint specific to the long, uh, being long, right? To being extended versus short, which is contracted, okay? Uh, you see Chinese lifters do this all the time where they'll do these heavy, heavy uh, uh, snatch, uh, snatch holds, okay? So where they'll stand up and hold a, a, a super maximal weight for up to five to seven seconds and trying to be specific to that long joint, all right? And then you look at short. So again, in, in, this, in this example, Okay, it's joint specific and, it, and it's short. You're looking at the hamstring, right? The hamstring is contracted. So if they were, if they were to uh, to to hold this isometric contraction, again, it, that 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 muscle is shortening and we're holding it in that short position. Okay, and then how do we use it, right? We look at it, it's another tool in the toolbox. You know, our I don't want to elude or, or or give this misinterpretation that our entire program is based around isometrics. I mean, if I were to break it down. As far as from a percentage standpoint, I probably use out of our entire program, we maybe use five percent isometric exercises to drive this. But I just think again, it's a it's a very cool topic, and it's a misunderstood uh, training element that couldn't be incorporated to increase the spring and avoid the ooze, right? So again, we use in the warm up. Why? Because there's a thermal response to it, right? Uh, we create better contractile environment. Uh, it turns or primes the nervous system on, okay, and increases speed of contraction, right? This ramping up. Um, increases enzyme act, uh, enzymic activity uh, and then increases coordination of muscle activity by the central nervous system. Again, you're getting that muscle, you're bringing more blood to that muscle and you're getting that muscle to talk to that brain at a faster rate, 
right? So what does that look like? Again, you know, we, we utilize more long duration isometrics in our warm up uh, with specific examples. We do plank, side plank, front plank. Um, we do push up holds. Uh, we do goblet squat holds. We might do split squat holds. Um, you know, it's the beauty of it is, is the creativity is unmatched. I mean, cause again, it's joint specific. So whatever that need for that day is, um, if you added in a 25 second or 30 second isometric hold to a movement that's very similar to what you're starting with, um, again, I think it's very beneficial or you, uh, uh, very, very beneficial, moving on, right? So then we talk about uh, post-action potentiation, right? So again, uh, you know, it's the, the old metaphor, like you, you see a, uh, a pail on the floor and you think it's full of water and you go to swing it and you swing and it's empty, you're gonna swing it at a faster rate than if you thought it was empty or knowing it was empty going into it, right? So we're tricking our body essentially into producing more force that's required uh, of the activity that we're, that we're experiencing, right? So again, you look at PAP, what does it do? Greater utilization of explosive muscle fiber, right? So again, uh, activating more fast twitch fibers, allows greater force in a rapid fashion. So rate of force development increases. Uh, you look at speed of signal uh, being sent to the muscle. So you talk about rate coding, you talk about the impulse being way stronger and way faster, right? And then the increased speed of power of contractions. Again, Inside that muscle, that contraction is is, is going to be is going to be stronger. Okay, and again, my, my drag racing metaphor, right? it's like the trans brake. If anyone's familiar with drag racing, right? A trans brake is this device that they put in to allow um, the car to take off at a higher RPM. So essentially, uh, that holds reverse and it holds uh, first gear and, and reverse at the same time. All right, which allows those RPMs to rev up higher than it normally would if you just had your foot on the brake, okay? Which allows, again, for more torque generation and for more, uh, more, more horsepower initially on the start. So why is this, how does this relate to, to, post, uh, to PAP, right? So that's what we're doing. We're tricking our body into ramping up uh, force production, and then we're allowing that body to experience something that's not uh, an external resistance that is not as, um stressful as as we previously thought it was so we're going to create more force per exercise or per movement or, or per environment whatever it might be than what is we thought was required okay so essentially taking that governor off it so again that trans break being able to hold that first and uh first and reverse at the same time to ramp up those rpms essentially those are what pap uh, isometric means will do for you in your training process right and then what is that you know we look at explosive uh, PAP yielding exercises. And one of the examples I used was is a, a uh, Bulgarian split squat jump with a weight release. So again, essentially, I don't have a video of it because again, we just weren't able to get uh, a lot of these videos and, and things together because of the fact that we had got hit with this current situation with the coronavirus. But essentially being in down in that, in that Bulgarian split squat and then holding two dumbbells and releasing the dumbbells and then driving them out of it, right? Because we get this potentiation because because we're in this this uh, this area, we're able to ramp up more force because of the external resistance of the dumbbells. As we release the dumbbells, our body still is experiencing and thinking that we have to create this force to overcome this. So we're going to create more force on the jump, right? Then you look at explosive PAP overcoming, which is, is probably the easiest way to integrate it into your program. Um, you get an immovable object, your body is going to create as much force as humanly possible against that immovable object. Then you go ahead and you translate it to a bar or to a squat. So again, you can see right here, uh, the demonstration of Matt Van Dyke is coming out of his book, uh, Apply Principles of Power Development. You can see that, again, it's a pin pull. So for us, you know, this could either relate to, and because it, it's joint specific, you get extremely creative with it. You could uh, turn around and do a box jump after this. You could turn around and do a clean after this. You could turn around and do a squat after this. There's a lot of application that comes involved with explosive PAP overcoming exercises. Um, and then again, you get into the realm of like, okay, well, and it's probably one of the questions already, but you know, coach, what about yielding and overcoming? Like, aren't we experiencing both of these in a lot of our movements? And it, and the answer is yes. So you look at your 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 typical pause squat. You have yielding isometric strength that you're building, and you have overcoming isometric strength that you're building, right? So we stop, we hold, we hold, and then we again we hit that concentric. We're allowed to we, we allow our body to ramp up that force production to overcome. Uh, the external resistance on our back, right? So again, you look at uh, pause bench, pause squat, any pause lunge variation, uh, you're gonna have that, both of these, uh, both of these components to it. 
okay? And then you look at long duration yielding, all right? And, and we've seen, uh, you know, a lot of people have gravitated, especially when you talk about uh, fiber types and how can we train fiber types to maximize their potential? So like a lot of muscles in the back are actually slow twitch in nature because they support posture, postural strength throughout the day. Well, how do we train those? If you want to train them in a, in a slow twitch manner, uh, long duration yielding exercises, so bat wings, uh, holds uh, via uh, either bent row or barbell row or pull-ups, uh, you can be as creative as you want, but you can see the benefits of it if you're going to go and try to maximize training uh, at uh, training stimuluses to match the fiber types that you are training, okay? And then you look at the, uh, long duration overcoming. Um, so again, a lot of the stuff that, we'll, that we use at, here at FAU is a lot of the iron ankle series from Chris Corfus. Um, as far as just, again, getting in that A-hole position, pushing up strong and tall, and then you could overload these, these long duration overcoming. But as you overload it, again, there's an inverse relationship between intensity and velocity. So as we overload it, we cut down the, the amount of duration of time, all right? Um, I hope I brought some clarity uh, to, to what seems to be a very complicated, uh, complicated um, training component. Um, and some understanding to it. Uh, I, again, the, the beauty of isometrics in a nutshell is that um, you can be joint specific, you can be creative. Uh, you don't need a ton of equipment. Uh, I, you know, again, there's a ton of people putting out uh, great content as far as how to use these, these specific uh, exercises um, at, at home with no equipment. Um, and then again, to me, I think it's Anytime that we can increase the stretch shortening cycle, the, the, the efficiency of the stretch shortening cycle, and from a mechanical standpoint, increase just the overall bo the bodily uh, stiffness and, and postural, uh, postural strength, I think is going to be extremely important to, uh, to athletes. This is my contact information. Um, if if y'all have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to any of the three uh, platforms I've provided. Um, and again, you know, anybody that's, that's watching, um, you know, we would appreciate it. And, uh, you know, Again, you know, hopefully this thing's over soon. Oh, that was great. We'll move on to the, uh, the Q&A section. Uh, so uh, I'll steal the first spot and I'll ask you, um, so you're discussing some of, the, uh, some of the training volumes of the actual isometric exercises. What, um, what would you say about uh, athletes with a younger training age and how they actually might look in their diet of training uh, as opposed to someone who's a little bit more advanced, like a college football player? So any any time you have uh, younger younger training ages, I think you need to start more general and, and you need to slow cook them. So again, um, I would start out with basic basic movements. So you know maybe holding uh, holding the body weight squat at ninety degrees or a split squat or um, you know something very basic in nature. I would start long duration, right? Because um, their bodies are not equipped because of their training age to hire, to, to handle higher intensity work yet, right? We have to build those capacities up as we move through uh, their, their, their training years, right? We just don't want to just hop into it because uh, there is risk of injury uh, with training modalities. That's good. Um, so first question here on, uh, on YouTube from Elijah Blackman, he's asking, uh, is, is static strength the only vital, uh, excuse me, uh, the only vital in the, uh, touchdown stance of, uh, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the, the touchdown and then the liftoff phase of sprinting. Can you say that question one more time for me? Yeah, so that's just worded a little funny here. So uh, is static strength the only vital, vital part in uh, the touchdown and then the, uh, the stance phase of sprinting? So static strength, as you, as I'm guessing he's alluding to isometric strength. Right. Um, I think – Again, because we're in that amortization phase, if, if we're not strong from an isometric standpoint, right, and we haven't developed this this stiffness in these in the specifically in the Achilles uh, ankle complex, right, that that stiffness through there through plyometric training and, and and through just sprinting in general, um, again, I think you'll be more prone to to oozing out energy and leaking energy, which will lead to uh, less force production and application as you get into that cyclical gait pattern, I think further on down as you go. Um, you know, so again, yeah, I think it's extremely important because uh, the, the body's ability to develop tensile strength, you look at collision sports, specifically not just to running, before we hit somebody, we tense up. 
Um, you know, that's why isometric training for the neck has been so, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it revolutionary, but it's, it's, it's had such a big impact on reducing concussions because it's this ability to, to maintain biomechanical positions in specific situations that require, like, so rapid stiffening when you're getting hit, rapid stiffening of that, again, those, those cold contractions at ankle when you're hitting that foot on that ground or when that foot is making ground contact. Great, great. Um, so the next question um, is from a barreled up baseball. Uh, I was asking about um, a five day split in the training week. He's asking uh, if you choose, if you choose your isometrics for PAP for a specific region or whatever you're training that day, or do you use it as a, as a basically like a lower CNS uh, movement to be able to train an opposite region, the same way that you'd split an upper and a lower in the same day, or you do, do you use it uh, in succession? So basically like, using PAP on the upper and then doing upper body workout versus using PAP on the upper just because you're not doing upper that day. So he's asking, do I do isometric exercises on days that I'm doing lower body, right? If, uh, do I use upper body exercises because of the high neural stress that's incorporated, right? Correct. Um, you know, we've, we've, I've played around with that idea um, as I move through my training calendar uh, we try to increase the density of our workouts. So we, we end up in the summertime, ended up being total body anyway. Um, and that's kind of when we utilize a lot of these PAP, uh, these potentiation clusters. Uh, so for us, again, trying to match stress with stress, I think in a perfect world, I would say, um, yes, I would do it on my high day. Um, you know, we don't live in a perfect world. So again, I don't think there's anything wrong with getting some potentiation specifically you know, um, if you're doing a bench press and you're trying to uh, potentiate the bench press, maybe with isometric uh, pin press or even your upper body stuff. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with putting it on a low day. Um, just understand that it's a little bit more neurally taxing. So again, when you just look at the overall accumulated fatigue of the week, incorporating that in. Uh, 